So when people ask me what my favorite period in art history is, it's got to be the Baroque. It's got action, it's got drama, it's got whatever this is. The Baroque is a ton of fun, but it's also 400 years old. And that means these days a lot of Baroque art doesn't exactly resonate. So I wanted to find a way for people to connect with this very cool, but also kind of foreign seeming art. And it turns out that even if the subjects of Baroque art are a little outdated, the artistic techniques aren't. In fact, many of the same visual strategies used by Baroque painters still show up in today's culture and in some pretty surprising places. Believe it or not, if you've ever seen a superhero movie, you can understand Baroque painting. Okay, I know it sounds a little crazy, but hear me out. During the Baroque, there were two major styles of painting. One is naturalism. And the poster boy for this style was an artist named Caravaggio, and it's all about being dark and gritty and realistic. Sound familiar? I'll look into it. And the other major trend is called the High Baroque, and these are folks like Rubens and Charles Lebrun. And this style is all about bright, bold action with lots of supernatural figures. Come to think of it, this one also rings a bell. Nice call. What else you got? Well, I'm glad you asked, because it's not just that Baroque paintings and superhero movies feature similar visual styles. They also use those styles in similar ways to project power, to ask questions, and to engage with societal trends. So fire up the bat signal, because today we're using superhero movies to take a deep dive into the Baroque. Baroque is a really broad term used to describe lots of different types of mostly Western art made between about 1600 and 1700. There's Baroque painting, Baroque music, Baroque architecture, Baroque furniture, and you can find this stuff everywhere from Poland to Mexico to India. But for the purposes of this video, we're just going to focus on Baroque painting in Europe. And we're actually just going to stick to one certain type of painting called history painting. So that means, unfortunately, things like still life aren't going to be a part of this conversation. Now, history painting refers to scenes from religion, mythology, and ancient history. And it was far and away the most important and prestigious type of painting during the Baroque. I mean, these were the big ticket items for kings and popes and dukes and bishops. Like cinema, history painting is a narrative form, and there's actually a lot of overlap with superhero movies. Baroque paintings and superhero movies both tell epic stories about superhuman characters, and they also both tell stories that are already kind of familiar. So think about it. When you go to see a Batman movie, you're not really going to see what happens. I mean, you kind of already know what's going to happen. The Joker's going to hold Gotham hostage and Batman's going to stop him. And this holds true for most superhero movies. I mean, Tony Stark's always going to put his ego above his loved ones. We're not going to like Bruce Banner when he's angry. He's a friend from work. So well, yeah, it is fun watching the plot unfold. What really makes a superhero movie is how a given actor inhabits a character and how a director builds a world and tells a story. It's pretty much the same for Baroque history painting. So in the 17th century, lots of folks in Europe knew the Bible and classical mythology backwards and forwards. What they were looking for was how a given artist told the story. What colors do they use? How are the figures arranged? And so what all this means is that the way that we experience superhero movies today is actually very similar to the the way people in the 17th century experienced Baroque history painting. The stories are all basically familiar, so we find new meaning in visual style and artistic choices. Speaking of which... In the late 16th century, Italian art was dominated by a bright and honestly kind of pretentious style called Mannerism. All that changed in the 1590s, when an artist from northern Italy named Caravaggio showed up in Rome and decided that Italian art needed, well, a gritty reboot. 
Caravaggio used a style called naturalism, which is all about making art that looks like the real world. So his paintings take place in real life locations, like this one showing Jesus and the Apostle St. Matthew, and it looks like it's just set in a normal everyday Roman tavern. And Caravaggio uses dark lighting and muted colors, which give his works a kind of down to earth feeling. And he creates a really tactile world. We feel like we can reach out and touch it because there's all sorts of things like coarse cloth and peeling stucco. There's hardly anything supernatural in Caravaggio's paintings. So normally in a scene like this, there'd be a big golden cloud burst with Jesus and a bunch of angels. There's none of that here. And finally, Caravaggio's paintings feel like they take place in the real world because he connects our real space with the space of the painting. I mean, the figures even sometimes reach out at us. Now, if all this sounds a little obscure, it really shouldn't, because 15 years ago, Christopher Nolan used pretty much the exact same artistic playbook when he made his three Batman films, sometimes known as the Dark Knight trilogy. So just like Caravaggio was responding to mannerism, Nolan was responding to a spate of over-the-top superhero movies. The Iceman cometh. And just like Caravaggio, Christopher Nolan's solution was to bring everything back down to earth. So Nolan uses lots of real life locations like back alleys and fire escapes and the dark lighting and the muted colors give that same down to earth feeling that we saw in Caravaggio. There's also lots of rough textures so we feel like we can reach out and touch the characters and close ups give us that same sense that we're right there in the action. And there's nothing supernatural in these movies. I mean, sure, these are superheroes, but they don't really have any superpowers. I mean, essentially, Nolan took a character out of the pages of a comic book and just plopped them in the middle of a real city, same way Caravaggio did with his religious subjects. There's still the question of why Caravaggio and Christopher Nolan chose to use this style. Well, one thing naturalism lets you do is explore real world issues. So the 17th century saw the birth of modern science. I mean, it was the time of people like Galileo and Francis Bacon's scientific method when people were becoming more interested in studying the world around them. And so Caravaggio brought this idea to religious painting. I mean, what does faith mean in the real world? Well, it means that martyrs aren't just spirits sitting up in the clouds. They were real people who gave their lives for their beliefs. And spiritual enlightenment isn't all, you you know, heavenly choirs, it can be messy and even frightening. And I think Christopher Nolan was after something similar. So the Dark Knight films contain a lot of very clear references to hot button political issues of the early 2000s. Things like the use of torture and the war on terror and Occupy Wall Street. And while Nolan maintains that his films are supposed to be apolitical, he's described his movies as trying to show the cracks of society, show the conflicts that somebody would try to wedge open. And so the naturalistic style of the films helps viewers connect with what they see on screen. I mean, if you're torturing an alien from outer space, it's a lot easier for the audience to say, eh, that's not really something that concerns me. Oh, give us the counts, man. Oh, One more interesting note on the naturalistic style. So Caravaggio was very influential on other artists, but naturalism was never really a big hit with the viewing public. I mean, these paintings explore complicated gray areas, and they could be a little, you know, Game of Thronesy. So it was only a small group of forward-thinking private collectors who supported Caravaggio's career. And I think there's a bit of a similar dynamic at play with the Dark Knight trilogy. I mean, yes, these movies were a massive box office success, but they can never really launch a 20-film multimedia behemoth like the Marvel movies. I mean, imagine watching 20 movies like the Dark Knight. You'd gouge your eyes out. Even to a guy like me, that's cold. Now, I wouldn't want you to think that Baroque art is all doom and gloom. So let's talk about the other major style of Baroque painting, known as the High Baroque. So if naturalism was about placing stories in the real world, then the High Baroque basically does the exact opposite. This is a world of pure fantasy. Scenes take place in these spotless rooms or ornately decorated palaces, or you know, sometimes all the action is just up in the clouds. The lighting is bright and it's even, and there's lots of vivid colors. And all the figures have impossibly smooth skin and these perfectly proportioned bodies. And all the guys look like they live at the gym and everything is explicitly supernatural. I mean, there's all sorts of angels and saints and gods just fluttering around. And finally, high Baroque paintings take place at a grand scale. I mean, the quintessential form of the high Baroque is the ceiling painting, which is basically just an enormous idealized view of heaven. Now, part of what makes the high Baroque so great is that it's just so over the top. 
And that's also a big part of the appeal of the defining superhero movie franchise of our time, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or MCU. A 27 film media juggernaut that includes the Avengers series and Black Panther, among many, many others. So just like with the High Baroque, the locations in MCU films are not at all realistic. Everything is bright and it's vivid and smooth and shiny. Scenes are set in these high-tech labs with fancy floating screens, or, you know, it all just takes place in outer space. Okay, who here hasn't been to space? Why? And same as with the High Baroque, the figures are all idealized. I mean, Captain America is basically a Greek god. And everything is very clearly supernatural. I mean, there's all sorts of magical stones and orbs and otherworldly auras and beams of light. And it seems like pretty much everybody can just fly. And it's all at a totally inhuman scale. It's kind of like if anything less than the fate of the planet is at stake, then it's sort of not even worth getting the team together. I mean, if the classic form of the High Baroque is the ceiling painting, which is basically a portal to another dimension with supernatural figures streaming through to save humanity from the forces of evil, then its 21st century equivalent is, well, this. You might still be wondering, well, what's the purpose behind this grand epic style? Well, because it embraces excess and spectacle, this style can help you project power. And if you were the Catholic Church or a Baroque king, then this was the kind of art that made you want to smash the like button. Hint, hint. During the Baroque, the Catholic Church was still reeling from the Protestant Reformation, which had essentially cut Christianity in half during the preceding century. So as a response, the Church mounted what was effectively a publicity campaign, and a major part of it was commissioning art that spoke to the power of the Church. At the same time, a new kind of political ruler was emerging in Europe, the absolutist monarch. And these were people like Louis XIV of France. These rulers believed they were chosen by God, which is an idea known as the divine right of king. And so they needed art to support this notion that they were basically demigods. And it's easy to see how the high Baroque style served these needs. I mean, it's all about richness and power and triumph and grandeur. And I think the MCU was after something similar. You see, prior to Iron Man in 2008, Marvel Studios mainly made money by licensing their characters to other studios to make movies. The MCU was Marvel's first foray into making their own films, so they could retain greater artistic control over their characters and also to keep more of the profits. I mean, the MCU was essentially a power play, and so Marvel made these opulent three-hour movies stuffed with A-list movie stars and dazzling special effects in order to cast themselves as a powerful enterprise. And where the tough questions and all the challenging content of Caravaggio's and Nolan's naturalistic style tended to limit their appeal, the Marvel style does the opposite. Louis XIV didn't want nuanced musings about the nature of divinity. He wanted eye-popping art that said, I am the state. And same thing for the MCU. There aren't a ton of tough moral questions to chew on, so the films go down easy and keep coming back for more. Now, for as much fun as I'm having intercutting Rubens paintings with clips from Guardians of the Galaxy, there's still some pretty big differences between Baroque history paintings and superhero movies. First of all, superhero movies are widely accessible, but while some Baroque history paintings were on public display, like in churches, many others hung in places like palaces and could only be seen by a small group of nobles. Second, both naturalistic and high Baroque history paintings tended to reflect the desires of their patrons, and this was usually about extending their influence, whether that was the Catholic Church trying to get people to be more religious, or a Baroque king trying to increase his courtier's loyalty. Superhero movies, on the other hand, reflect our desires, since as the audience, it's our money that drives the whole enterprise, which has driven some pretty cool changes, like superhero movies embracing diversity, and even Marvel blockbusters beginning to tackle more substantive issues. And this is a kind of power shift that never would have been possible in the 17th century. But with all that said, there's still something that kind of bugs me, which is, why is there this uncanny resemblance between Baroque painting and superhero movies? And to be perfectly honest, I haven't really come up with a definitive solution. So if you have any thoughts, definitely let me know in the comments. Personally, I think it has something to do with the way art responds to societal change. So the 17th century was a time period that completely rocked what people thought they knew about the world. 
I mean, Catholicism was no longer the only Christian religion. There was a whole other continent on the other side of the Atlantic. The Earth was no longer the center of the universe. Some artists grappled with these new understandings, while others saw art as a way to escape into the otherworldly. Well, 400 years later, we're also going through a period of massive societal change in technology, in geopolitics, and movies, our dominant art form, take these same two roads. Some confront the issues of the day head on, while others provide a source of escapism. So the next time you're at a museum, take a stroll through the Baroque galleries. Hopefully the art there will feel a little more relatable. Just do me a favor, don't be this guy.